So how and why did you set up the VDT? When I began serving geriatrics uh, 35 years ago, it was hard for me to understand how it was that we kept them marginalized, put in rooms by themselves, even using chemical and physical restraints simply because they weren't able to perform in the ways everyone else did. It not only bothered me, but I felt like there were things that could be done. So I began to develop some training programs for staff, for families, for you know different people, <clears throat> and I really wasn't seeing the change happening. I wasn't seeing people identifying with the person with dementia. I continued to see the same sort of pulling and tugging at them and speaking very loudly and abruptly and uh, chastising them for having difficulty bathing, dressing, and grooming. And it just, I could not figure that out. So when it came time for me to decide what my dissertation was going to be, I th thought, well, what is a problem that I'd really like to solve? Well, the problem was, how can I get people to understand what it might be like to have dementia so that maybe they could start to serve them better? So in doing that, I began to study how the brain dies. And when I looked at the brain scans and the imaging, and I parlayed the information in the damage in the brain to what happens behaviorally as a result of that damage in the brain, then I began to figure out that maybe I could replicate that in a normal brain and really kind of trick it into thinking it has uh, a cognitive decline. <clears throat> then I coupled that with tasks to do and eventually after a lot of trial and error, the virtual dementia tour was born. And how long ago was that you set it up originally? I began my research in 2000. I made it available in 2002. Quite frankly, I expected it just to be a research paper with a dissertation and peer-reviewed and published. That was really all I was going for. But after I finished this study, several nursing homes called me back up and said, would you come out and do it again? And I did, and then I realized, you know, this might be something that a lot of nursing homes would do, and now we're in hospice, home health fire departments, police departments, uh, the capitals in a lot of cities, uh, businesses, places like that, so that we can all become more dementia aware. So do you think people who are working with people with dementia, it's not just the, the care homes, it is the fire service and the police service and offices right. and things like that, right. and have they benefited from how the BDT works? Well, they have because, you know, they're the first responders, the people in the fire service and the, and the police department. And so many times they get called by someone who's wandering away or my favorite one is that the police department gets called in by an elderly person who's living alone and has some cognitive decline. And they'll call 911 and the police department shows up and they don't realize that the person's so confused that their own reflection in their windows, if they don't have a curtain on the window, makes them think they're being watched or being followed. So they become paranoid and they stay in one room. Well, if the police department doesn't know that, they're gonna call social services and have them, have them admitted to a psychiatric unit because the place isn't surrounded. Mm -hmm. So when in fact, all they really needed to do was close the curtains, act like they're checking the place out and then leave. So uh, that keeps them in the home longer rather than placing them in an institutional setting. So any of those kinds of things, being able to go to a restaurant, if you have a cognitive impairment, how frustrating it is to get to a restaurant and look at this menu you can still read the words, but you don't understand really what it's saying. So you order something and it shows up and you don't remember that that's what you ordered and you get upset and you argue, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So training the waiters and waitresses not to worry about the menu and asking them, so what's your favorite food? Let's see what we can make here today that's gonna be your favorite food. And they talk about their memories and their favorite food and they bring them their favorite food. Well, they're not gonna turn that down. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, there's just different way of thinking when we, when we we begin to uh, incorporate those living with dementia in our regular lives. So the VDT itself, I mean, some people thought it was, um, you know, where I've spoken to people, it was almost a, you know, an amusement, a, a game really, but right. when you actually do it, it, it's real and we get real reactions. Uh, do people, what sort of reactions do you get from people once they've done it? 
Is it fear? Is it enlightenment? You know, I see people's faces change once they've done it. Right. Uh, is, is that a picture you found across the board? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Uh, the one from families is usually, I wish I had known. Um, that's a tough one to swallow. And of course, the response from the virtual dementia tour trainer should be something like, well, you do now and let's not worry about the past, let's worry about how we're gonna move forward. So what are the things that struck you during the virtual dementia tour that you might be able to do better with your family member? So that one is a tough one. Most of the time it's, uh, it's interesting, now that we've done it for so many years, we're learning that the first time somebody goes through the tour, it's usually a little bit of shock and awe. Is it really like this? Well, actually our studies are pretty clear that this is what they experience and in fact, when you watch a person going through the tour and you're familiar with what dementia behavior is like, it's amazing how similar the two are. It really is amazing. So we know we're as close as we can possibly get without actually having the disease. So when a person goes through the tour and comes out, they usually are asking that question. Could this really be what this is like? And that's number one. Interestingly enough, the second time they go through the VDT, and we alter some of the things in the VDT so that there's not a practice effect. The second time they go through it, they come out going, oh, okay, so I could feel myself acting like either a resident or a family member or an acquaintance. And they begin to start to incorporate what they went through in almost like a one-off. They don't personalize it so much almost like in a one-off, which tells us that they're beginning to uh, connect the dots from the experience to the outside, uh, the outside person. And the third time they go through the VDT, which we recommend it be given about eight to 10 months apart, the third time they go through the VDT, that's when the teachers can really spend time with them and say, okay, so here's what you did here. Now, if Mrs. Jones was doing this, what would you do differently? So it is, it's, the responses are different for the family members, the care providers, the uh, fire departments, the businesses. They're all different, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all behaving like dementia. And the first time they go through is different than the second time, and it's different from the third time. And the thing that's compelling about that is so many people say, but dementia, different people with dementia behave in different ways. So how can you actually, well, the fascinating thing is that even though the people going through the tour are experiencing the same tour, they respond to it completely differently. And that's, that's the beauty part of that. I've seen no pattern really yeah, with people, right. the reactions they have, how they work, how they do it. But the bit that I found is most important really is, is the honesty and the debrief. Yes. Do you find that as well? The debrief is the important thing. That's where uh, yeah. in there you'll have questions. In the debrief you get the answers. Mm -hmm. Is that what the general sort of you Yes, think? yes. The VDT is nothing without a great debrief. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it, it then would be a game or a gimmick. Uh, it's the debrief when the person comes out and all of their guard is let down and they're vulnerable and they're, under, they're, they're like sponges. They just want to understand what they just went through and how it applies to their family members or their care partners. So uh, if, if we have someone who's debriefing without good experience in not only the virtual dementia tour and the impact it has on behavior, but also a good general sense of training in dementia, then it's probably not gonna be very effective. Yeah. And finally, it's not something people need to be scared about doing, is it, the VDT? It is an educational and you know, really enlightening type experience. It's not frightening in that sense. It's not, no. it's, I think everyone should do it, personally. Well, of course. Uh, well, so here's how I view the fear factor. And of course, everybody's gonna be a little bit nervous before they go through, right? But every other disease in our world today can be described to you. A person that's suffering from some heart disease can tell you, my heart's beating really fast, I'm starting to feel a little lightheaded. They can talk you through it almost. Diabetes, you know, they start to develop some, uh, you know, ketones and everything gets off, so they start to get lightheaded as well, and they can actually tell you. Um, every disease almost, um, and, and dementia is the sixth Alzheimer's disease, is the sixth leading cause of death, and the only of the 10 that has no cure. Uh, 
So we can do some symptoms management, but that's not even very good. It's very limited. So, so what we have is a disease that we can't, they can't tell us what's happening. It's the only disease. They can't say a word. And to add insult to injury, we aren't really even that definitive on the actual diagnosis until autopsy. When we look at a brain image of someone who's experiencing dementia, we can see the widening of the sulci, we can see the, you know, the uh, fluid-filled cavities, we can see some of that, and we can see some of the lesions in the brain as a result of it. But there are a lot of people who we've looked at that brain image that looks exactly like someone who, uh, that we can look at two together, that look a much the same, and this one is still functioning in the environment relatively well. This one is in late stage dementia. So, so you see that the coping mechanisms, we, we have yet to break that code. So why wouldn't you want to take the time to figure out what it might be like for these people since they can't tell us? To me, it's almost, without, for lack of a better explanation, it's almost a bit self-absorbed not to want to figure out how we can help these people who are voiceless. And that to me is that human nature is to learn and to be curious and to grow and to uh, be empathic. And we can't do any of that unless we take a minute to see what their life is like.